On March 1999, a lady answered the door to a young girl and all she was wearing was a dog collar. Little did they know that this escape would help them reveal the true horrors of the toy box killer. Hi, my name is Sarah Jane and welcome to my channel where we talk about true crime, unsolved cases and more. If this is something you're interested in, feel free to subscribe. Now let's get into this week's case. Before we begin, I just want to give a quick content warning. In this video, we will be talking about the rape and torture of women. So if this is something you can't watch, feel free to switch off now and we'll see you in the next video. On the 22nd of March 1999, a young lady knocks on the door of a trailer in New Mexico. When the owner answers, all she sees is a young girl naked apart from an iron dog collar around her neck and a six foot chain. She immediately brings the girl in and calls the police. And the girl said that she'd been held captive and raped repeatedly for the last few days. All she kept shouting was, keep them away from me, save me, they kidnapped me. The young girl was called Cynthia Vigil. She was a 22 year old sex worker and she said she had been abducted by one of her clients. When the police arrived, she described how she'd been taken from Albuquerque, brought to a man's house, chained to a post and was only given a bed and a bucket to use. Luckily, she could tell the police exactly where she'd been taken from and she led them to the house. When they arrived, they searched through the house and they found in the sitting room the place that she was held captive. They found the bed and the bucket and it looked like there'd been a struggle. They decided to check the rest of the house and in the garden, they found a soundproof trailer, which the owner, David Parker Ray, called his toy box. David Parker Ray was born on the 6th of November, 1939 in New Mexico. He lived with his grandfather as his father was an alcoholic and his mother didn't want anything to do with them. His grandfather was described as quite strict and quite abusive towards them. Although his father didn't live with him, he would visit them regularly. And when he did, he used to beat him and provide him with sadistic porn that fed his fetish at a young age. When David attended school, he was bullied quite severely due to his inability to speak to women. He started to abuse drug and alcohol and his love for sadism grew. He used to boast to friends about how he killed a woman at knife point, but there was no evidence that was ever found. David then went to serve in the US Army. He got married four times and had two children. One of his daughters called Glenda, officially known as Jessie, grew up around his sick fetishes and was exposed to it at quite a young age. She got a taste for it and later on became his accomplice. David moved to Elephant Butte in New Mexico. He became a mechanic for the local state park and was well respected for his technical ability and usually was the employee of the month. He was described as real nice, smart, and was eager to help everyone around him. It was around this time that he met Cindy Hendy. Cindy was born Cindy Lee Hendy in 1960 and was raised in an impoverished neighborhood in the outskirts of Everett in Washington. Her mother was an alcoholic and worked for the local bar and would quite often leave her at home and let her go hungry. When she was 11 years old, her mum's boyfriend tried to rape her. When she told her mum, he said that he'd just mistaken her bed for his and her mum believed him over her own child. And at the age of 12, she was chucked out. She then became dependent on drugs and alcohol. And it was around this time that she enjoyed aggressive sex and would talk to her boyfriends about her rape fantasies. She had three children by three different men. And by the time the youngest was 10 years old, they were living with their grandparents. In 1997, she fled the state as she had convictions against grand theft auto and drug charges. She moved to Elephant Butte and worked at the state park where she met David. They bonded over their sex fantasies and they soon moved in with each other. On March 1999, David went to work and left Cindy alone with Cynthia at home. She accidentally left the keys to her handcuffs quite near her and when she went to get some food, Cynthia tried to escape. She came back into the room as Cynthia was calling 911. She ended the call and they ended up in a struggle. Cynthia was able to attack her with an ice pick and escape. She ran to the next door neighbour's house and knocked on the door. When the police arrived, she told them about her ordeal and what had happened to her. She believed that this wasn't their first time as he would say stuff like, I'm going to kill you like the rest of them. When the police arrive, they arrest David and take him in for questioning. They want to investigate her claims and get his side of the story. When questioning him, he said that she had agreed to the rough sex sessions and he hadn't kidnapped her. When the police entered the house, they found the bed in the sunken area of the living room. There was also the waste basket and a lamp that had been knocked over in the struggle. This corroborated with Cynthia's story. They decided to search the rest of the house and this wasn't the worst they would find. In the garden, they found a soundproof trailer and when they entered, they were in for a shock. The police described it as nothing they'd ever seen before. In the middle of the room, there was a gynecological chair and above it was hung chains and pulleys. 
All around were whips, sexual torture devices and medical equipment everywhere. But on the side there were syringes and there was information on how to bring someone back when they were pushed to the edge of drugs and abuse. On the wall there was also loads of diagrams and there was a list of things that people had used to try and escape, such as kids, pregnancy and having HIV. There was also another list of things that he shouldn't forget, such as handcuffs and neck chains. In the room they found a monitor and video equipment and this prompted them to go and look for tapes as they believed Cynthia wasn't their first victim. In the house they found over 100 tapes which the police went through to see if they could find any evidence. The police wanted to get some more evidence that would back up Cynthia's claim. She was a drug addict and a sex worker and they believed that she wouldn't be a credible witness in court and they wouldn't believe her testimony. As they had no proof that he'd been used in the room, it was only her word against his. They started to go through the tapes and on the first few they didn't find anything. Then they came across one where David was checking all his equipment. It then went blank and then when it cuts back to him, he's a woman held captive in the chair. She's quite drowsy and he's tied up. They then notice that she's got a tattoo on her leg and they decide to send this to the FBI who would enhance it and send it to the media to see if the woman would come forward. Around this time, another witness came forward called Angelica Montana. She described how David and Cindy had captured her in February 1999 and they'd left her on the side of the road after they'd kept her captive for a couple of days. She went to the police but her complaint was never followed up. Eventually, a lady did come forward and say the tattoo was hers and it was her in the videotapes. She had a very vague memory of what happened but she had had nightmares ever since. Her name was Kelly Garrett and she was a 24 year old childminder and she was also a friend of David's daughter, Jessie. Around the time of the incident, she had just been married a couple of days and she'd gone out to a bar with a couple of her friends. She had stayed there late and ended up just being with Jessie at the end. She believed that Jessie had drugged her beer and then she offered her a lift home. However, when she woke up, she was on David's couch and they had a knife to her neck. They put a dog collar around her neck, chained her up, put her in handcuffs and duct taped her mouth. She was then taken to the trailer where she suffered two days of abuse. She would come to a few times and could recall some of the things that had happened to her. After a few days, David slit her throat and dumped her on the side of the road. Somehow she managed to survive. She went home and told the police and her husband. However, they didn't believe her as she couldn't recall some of the information. After this, her marriage broke down as her husband thought that she'd gone on a drug binge during this time and had cheated on him. So she fled to Colorado and ever since then, she'd had horrific flashbacks. Although this helped strengthen the evidence against David, it wouldn't help much in the case as they believed that she wouldn't be a strong witness due to the gaps in her memory. It was later found out that David used drugs on his victims that would cause severe amnesia and this would mean that they wouldn't remember much of the deal of what happened to them. This would also mean there could be victims out there that never knew what happened. After her testimony, David's daughter, Jessie, was arrested on her part in the abduction of Kelly. It was later found out she would go to bars, lure women into having drinks with her, then take them home to her dad. She gave birth to a child in 1990 and she denied rumours that her father was a dad. Around this time, they also arrested Cindy and during her interrogation, she quickly turned on David and agreed to a plea deal in exchange for telling them what really happened. She told them when she moved in with him, he told her about the abductions and murders. She would then become his accomplice and go around and target women and bring them back home for him. She would then watch him as he raped and tortured them. She described how he used to have a screen that, so they could see what was happening to them. He also used to play a video beforehand to them, so he would describe what he was going to do to them as he liked to see the pain and fear in their eyes. He would end the video with a set of rules on how they would survive. He would tell them to be smart and be a survivor. Don't ever scream, be quiet, be docile, and above all, give him the proper respect. She reported 14 murders and their burial sites, but when they went to search these areas, no bodies were ever found. During her interview, she also gave up another accomplice, Dennis Yancey. She described how he had helped David commit one of these murders. Dennis was brought in for questioning and he quickly confessed to the murders. One year after Kelly's abduction, Marie Parker went missing from the same bar. She was a 21 year old mother with two children. That night, she had gone to the bar to have a drink, few drinks with her friends. Around midnight, she decided to go back and check on her two children and said she would be back. However, she never returned. Jessie and Dennis had been at the bar as well and they had followed her out and had taken her home back to David. Dennis described how David tortured her over two days and in the evening he would put her on a cot and slid her into the wall which had a padlock on it. After two days he instructed Dennis to kill her with a rope. He used the rope and tied it around her neck and he said if he didn't do it he would do the same to him. So he strangled her, they put her in the boot of the car, drove her up to the desert and dropped her down a ravine and covered her up with some dirt. 
Dennis took them to the ravine where they had buried her in the desert. However, they searched for over a week and still they could not find the body. Dennis believed that David had gone back and taken the body and reburied her so that he didn't get caught. Dennis pleaded guilty to the murder and received 22 years in prison. However, they couldn't prove that David was involved, so he was not convicted on her murder. During the search of David's property, they found loads of evidence which would point towards him being a prolific serial killer. They found tapes where he described killing over 39 women and he mentioned it in his writings, drawings and tapes. They found the recording of him describing what he was going to do to each of the women and described how they would be drugged with sodium pethanol and phenobarbital so they wouldn't remember a thing. I'm going to read some of what was said on the tape. Hello there bitch, are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, probably blindfolded. You're distorted and scared too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a while at least, you need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. It is very relevant to the situation. I'm going to tell you in detail why I've kidnapped you, what's going to happen to you and how long you'll be here. Now you're obviously here against your will, totally helpless, don't know where you are, don't know what's going to happen to you, you're very scared, all very pissed off. I'm sure you've already tried to get your wrists and ankles loose. And no, you can't. No, just wait and see what happens next. After we get completely through with you, you're going to be drugged up real heavily with a combination of sodium pethanol and phenobarbital. They are both hypnotic drugs. They will make you feel extremely susceptible to hypnosis, auto-hypnosis and hypnotic suggestion. You're going to be kept drugged for a couple of days while I play with your mind. By the time I get through brainwashing you, you're not going to remember a fucking thing about this little adventure. You won't remember this place or us or what happened to you. They also found a map in his house of the local river and on it had X marks. They believed this could be the places he'd dumped the bodies. So they sent out divers to have a look. They went on two to three dive missions. However, they were unable to find any of the bodies. They also found his diary, which described over 50 murders over the last few decades. They found loads of trinkets, necklaces and rings at the scene and they believed they must belong to somebody. So they took pictures of all the evidence and sent them out to the media to see if anyone would come forward. However, no one did. Even with all this evidence mounted against him, the prosecutors would never be able to make a case as they had no bodies. So he would never be charged for murder. However, they pushed forward to charging him for rape and abduction of the three women. Sadly, Angelique had died before the trial, so the case relied heavily on Kelly's and Cynthia's testimonials. The trial went on for two weeks and Kelly gave evidence against David. She described in court how he was very smug and was acting all innocent. However, some of the evidence was suppressed, such as the video I just read to you, as Kelly couldn't remember David playing it to her. So all the evidence they had was her testimonial and the videotape. They brought the videotape and showed it to the court. However, the defence argued David's story that it was consensual and she'd agreed to be taped. He described how she wasn't fighting back and she was just laying on the table and wasn't fighting David. However, we know that she'd been drugged. For David to be convicted, it had to be a unanimous vote. However, one person didn't believe Kelly and they couldn't come to agreement, so the judge declared it as a hung jury. There was a decision to retry the case nine months later, with a different jury and a different judge. This time, the new judge allowed the tape recordings to be played in court. He believed that it was significant to the case. It took the jury only five hours to deliberate and come back with a guilty verdict, and he was sentenced to 224 years in prison. He then gave up his right to appeal as a plea bargain for his daughter. His daughter was only given two and a half years for kidnapping and five years of probation. There is no evidence of her whereabouts now. Cindy took a plea deal and was given 36 years in prison. However, she only served 19 years and she was let out on July 15, 1999. Frustratingly, David only served three years of his prison sentence. Eight months after the second trial, he had a heart attack in prison and died. Although this case is seen as the sole case as David was convicted, some people will believe that it will never be closed as none of the bodies were ever found. They still have the jury up, hoping someday someone will come forward. They believe that David lived in the perfect area to dispose of bodies and went to a great length to get rid of his victims. He lived on the outskirts of the lake, which was the largest body of water in New Mexico. He had a sailing boat and he knew the river very well and he knew where the deepest places were where he could dispose of the bodies. Also, because of his job, he had access to every area of the state parks and keys to places where people couldn't go. There was vast amounts of deserts everywhere and too many creeks and ravines for the police to search to find the bodies. So this is the end of the case. It's a very frustrating one, as David didn't really get any punishment for what he did. There's also 
so many unanswered questions about how many people he did kill and who the victims were. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. You call me a saint, but you know I'm a stranger, a willing and able.